It is an honor to be with so many friends and supporters. And um, to be here to mark the first year of the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, it is time um, that is defined, a time that is defined by uncertainty. Well, how motivational is that? Uh, that's what Congresswoman Elise Stefanik is on, one of the leaders of the Democratic Party, as she tries to get her party out of the minority uh, once and for all in 2022. Congresswoman Stefanik, welcome back. Great to be back, Brian, but I'm one of the leaders in the Republican Party, not the Democratic Party. <laughs> right, but that was one of the leaders of the Democratic Party, the Kamala Harris, who's, who says uh, it is a uh, def this last year has been defined by uncertainty. Well, it's been defined by a disaster, and it's been defined by crisis after crisis. And every American should ask themselves, are they better off or worse off than one year ago? And across the board, Republicans, Democrats, independents, every American family is worse off because of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's failures in partnership with Speaker Pelosi and the Senate leader Chuck Schumer. On every issue that matters, on inflation, this is the highest rate of inflation since, since before I was born, Brian, since 1981. I was born in 1984. Uh, inflation has gone up almost every Every month of Joe Biden's presidency, and that hits people every day when they go to the grocery store, when they go to the gas pump. You know, on top of that, we have the border crisis, uh, the highest number of illegal immigrant apprehensions in my lifetime. And 2021, unfortunately, uh, 2022 is it's likely not to slow down because there is no effort to secure the border. So Kamala Harris is really out of touch, as is Joe Biden, as he showed at his disastrous press conference this week. So do you think it was a disaster? I know they're trying to walk back the comments on Ukraine. They're trying to walk back their doubts about election integrity and also going after Republicans saying, what are you for? What are you for? Let's listen. Well, I did not anticipate well, that there'd be such a stalwart effort to make sure that the most important thing was that President Biden didn't get anything done. Think about this. What are Republicans for? What are they for? Name me one thing they're for. Maybe maybe you want to answer that question because it's not up to the press to outline the Republican agenda. So I don't know who he was talking to. I'm happy to answer that question. Republicans are for the Constitution. We are for keeping kids in school. We are against unconstitutional mandates. We are for balanced budgets. We are for lower taxes. We are for border security. We are for strong national security and peace through strength. All of those issues Joe Biden is against, and it's been a far left agenda out of touch with mainstream America. Uh, we are for safe communities. Uh, let's talk about the crime crisis, uh, which continues to skyrocket across the country in states like my home state in New York, states like California, but also parts of the Midwest. Uh, this is on Joe Biden's watch. And what was interesting about his press conference, Brian, which was an absolute disaster, is Joe Biden used to say the buck stops with him. He blamed everybody else. That was a blame game, you know, not taking any accountability press conference. And it was massive cleanup that his White House staff had to do uh, in the hours and day after. No question. And the other story that I can't get any traction on nationally is what's going on with crime, especially in New York, where these are we at the point yet, Congresswoman Stefanik, where people are beginning, even Democrats beginning to push back against these permissive DAs who think criminal first. Alvin Bragg is the latest to win an election thanks to George Soros's million dollars that people just ignored this. And he came in, clarified in a memo that these prosecutors should stop prosecuting or quit. And then he tried to clarify yesterday. Tell me if this makes you feel any better. Cut 37. Bail reform, I'm going to I'm sure that's going to be talked about a lot during the legislative session. Um, you know, one thing I would say is in a number of these cases, and I don't want to talk about specific ones, but but bail is being talked about, um, you know, particularly I'll talk about it for the, in the context of some of the gun cases, um, you know, where nothing changed on the bail law with respect to guns. Um, so I'm kind of ha ha happy to sort of as the uh, session goes forward and people are having specific conversations to, to, to engage with those. Um, but I do think it's important to sort of point out what changed and what didn't. And I've heard a lot of discussion about, you know, you know, guns and the laws to get but bail and guns didn't change.
So what he basically has said is to uh, pros uh, stop prosecuting crime. And the old, his own police commissioner said, I can't believe this. He says, uh, if you're ordered to... Uh, uh, if you're ordered to halt a prosecution on some level of crime, also vowed to downgrade charges in some cases of armed robbery and burglary. He tried to clarify about guns. It makes no sense. He says he's basically said lay off marijuana misdemeanors, prostitution, resisting arrest and fair dodging. So are we just have do we have to lay back as Americans and just watch things go to hell? No, we shouldn't lay back, and voters need to understand that their votes have consequences, and I think people are realizing that. I think that's why you saw such strong performance among, frankly, Republicans statewide in New York in local elections uh, against this really far-left agenda. I mean, you go to New York City, it is no longer the same New York City it was just three or four years ago. Uh, it is not safe. Look at the subway, the horrific, you know, that poor woman who was young, had so much of her future ahead, pushed on the subway. You just had a, a young baby, and I'm a new mom. My heart absolutely breaks uh, for that death, that killing of a stray bullet uh, in the last 48 hours. Uh, this is unsustainable, and, you know, it's very sad in New York. It's why we're losing population uh, who are moving elsewhere. But you're right, Brian, to point out this has been an effort from George Soros and the far left for many, many years. And it's not just in blue states, but in DAs, uh, in key, you know, regions across America uh, that that side with the criminals rather than with, you know, the people they represent in law enforcement. And bail reform has been an absolute disaster in New York State. Look no further than the crime stats. Look at the skyrocketing homicide rates. Look at the overall crimes uh, in New York City. Uh, and, and again, it's not just in New York City. It's other parts of the state and other parts of the country as well. Um, so you you saw that press conference and you saw where we stand right now with Ukraine and Anthony Blinken seemed to have made no progress with Foreign Minister Lavrov in Russia. Um, Congresswoman, I think Republicans are are pretty much split on how involved we should get. I personally think we should get very involved and avoid a second Cold War and send a message to Vladimir Putin. But people I really respect like uh, Tucker Carlson, my colleague here, is totally against we should not be involved at all. Where do you stand? My position is Ukraine is an important partner for us, and they are important geopolitically because of their geographic location and because uh, it is really Putin's testing ground. Uh, we have seen that uh, Vladimir Putin previously, whether it's cyber incursions or the Crimea, uh, he is making inroads. And this year, not only is the one-year anniversary of Joe Biden's presidency, but it's actually you know an anniversary for the Soviet Union as well. And Vladimir Putin wants to put together the former Soviet Union. I think it's important for us to stand with democracies. It's important for us to stand with our partners. What's very frustrating that Joe Biden is doing is he basically, you know, you don't say, well, there'll be consequences after you attack. In order to deter attacks, which should be the goal, they should be tough on Russia right now. Uh, for example, sanctioning the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, again, you have Joe Biden giving giveaways to Vladimir Putin from the beginning of his presidency, and Putin senses weakness. In the first year of any presidency, our adversaries test the commander-in-chief, and Joe Biden has failed those tests. So what have I supported in the past? As I said, I'm on the Armed Services Committee. I'm on the House Intelligence Committee. I've supported providing advanced weapons to Ukraine. Uh, I've supported training operations to ensure that our Ukrainian partners uh, have access to the best training possible. I've actually been to Ukraine before on a delegation. And uh, again, if we want to make sure that Russia is not on the rise, it's important that Ukraine maintain its sovereignty and its geogra geographic borders. Uh, what is concerning and just outrageous. I never thought I would hear a president of the United States ever say a minor incursion, um, you know, as if it's okay, as if giving the green light to an adversary to uh, commit a minor incursion. There's no such thing as a minor incursion. Uh, you know, on our border, we have a major incursion and we see the absolute crisis it is. So uh, it has been a real disappointment and it's not the only foreign policy failure under Joe Biden. Uh, Elise Stefanik, our guest. Uh, Congresswoman, I just got to ask you, too, with this China bill, should have been a layup. The Senate gives it to the House, and, if, and Nancy Pelosi sat on it. Now I understand uh, they're beginning to make progress. And what we do is provide $52 billion to start our own chip industry because we basically gave it up. Taiwan is the other place that makes chips for our cars. What could you tell us about the content to this bill and what the holdup has been in the House? 
So I've been one of the lead voices for the CHIPS Act, and it is important when we think about uh, future manufacturing, just the future of everything, future of technology, CHIPS are going to be the driver, and we want to make sure that we are not dependent upon China, that we have those manufacturing capabilities in the United States. Uh, That investment is critical. It not only creates jobs, but it allows us to maintain the cutting edge on one of the most important technologies uh, in this century. So it's an important bill. I've been a leader on it. It hasn't actually, it's tied to my district as well. We have a, a business nearby, called a manufacturer called Global Foundries. Uh, but it's important for national security. It's important for economic security. And what we saw during the COVID pandemic is we can no longer rely on, on, you know, on Asia, on China for manufacturing. We saw the outcomes when we've become so dependent when it comes to our supply chain. And we have to rebuild American manufacturing, particularly with technology such as chips. Lastly, Donald Trump was on with Sean Hannity last night when asked about his prospects of running. Here's what he said. Cut 33. Are you running in 2024? We have 15 seconds. (laughs) Well, I think you'll be happy, but we'll let you know at a little bit later date. What do you hope he says? And uh, what do you think he means by that? I know he's been a supporter of yours and you've been a supporter of his. Yeah, you know, I think uh, people definitely have buyer's remorse. Uh, those who voted for Joe Biden polling shows that, that many people uh, regret that vote. And I think President Trump is very focused, and we've talked about this, on making sure we win back the midterms in the House. Uh, and that will be important leading into the 2024 presidential. Uh, I hope he runs. And, um, you know, I think that was the right answer. He can take his time in making this decision, but he's really been a part of our team to make sure we can win and fire Nancy Pelosi once for all if Republicans win back the House. Congress, uh, Congressman Lee Zeldin took a risk. He left a contentious district uh, on Suffolk County, New York, and says, I'm going to run for governor. And many people say, wow, you, you can't win as a Republican. Did somebody, did something show, did something in the polls show someone like you uh, what happened on Long Island, what happens in upstate and possibly the city, that maybe this state might be giving a Republican a second look for the first time since George Pataki? I think it is the best opportunity in a generation for Republicans to win uh, the governor's race in New York. And um, I'm glad that there are strong candidates who are running. Um, I think if you look at just the trends and the outcomes of the local elections last November, there were a lot of surprises. And not only did Republicans win numerous ballot measures uh, when we were, you know, had less funding behind them, but we won, you know, key races in, uh, you know, what I consider the downstate region because I'm way up in the north country. But I think voters are going to turn out big and they want to change in Albany. Similar to what we've seen in Washington when it's unified government, we've seen that with super majorities in Albany. And look at the results. I mean, we are losing population, the tax proposals continue to climb, the regulations continue to get worse, the unconstitutional mandates that Kathy Hochul is putting into place, the gross mismanagement during COVID and the horrible, horrible fatalities of our seniors and nursing. So I think it's a great opportunity for Republicans to put forth a message and win. And I'm going to be out there campaigning with the Republican nominee to give us the best shot. So, yeah, and you don't kiss. So you're not going to weigh in whether it's Rob Astorino, whether it's Andrew Giuliani or Lee Zeldin. You know, I will. Pro- I, I'm friends with them all. I serve with Lee, and Lee has the endorsements of county chairs. Uh, there's a convention coming up. I'm going to let that play its course, and um, you know, I'll probably weigh in before the primary. But uh, right now, it's important that you know Republicans are engaged. And I actually think having multiple candidates is a strength. When I first ran, I had a primary, and it helped me become the strongest candidate I could going into the general election. And so, how's your uh, yeah? How's your family doing? Oh, they're doing great. Uh, Sam, my my son, he's our first child, is uh, almost five months. And, you know, that's when they're, he's always had a little personality, but it's really coming out now with the smiles and the beginning to talk and and starting a little bit of the eating. So it's just, it's joyful. And uh, I should note today is March for Life in Washington, D.C. And I will tell you that as a new mom who was just so excited every step of the way, uh, as Sam grew when I was pregnant, um, there's nothing more important than protecting life. And it's just very, very special to be a new mom. Uh, And it's a challenge like lots of parents out there juggling everything, but it makes me even more passionate about the work that I'm doing to make sure that 
we have a positive future in this country that protects the American dream for my son and future generations. Gotcha. Uh, I don't know how you're doing it. Two separate, uh, two separate cities war- working full time, Washington and New York. At the same time, you're in leadership as well as representing your district. But she does it all. Lee Stefanik, thanks so much, Congresswoman. Thanks, Brian. All right.